Greetings, everyone. My name is Madeline Sullivan, and I'd like to welcome you to um, our webinar, Integrating Human Trafficking with School Emergency Operations Plans for K-12 Schools. This webinar is being hosted by the U.S. Department of Education, Office of Safe and Healthy Students, and the Readiness and Emergency Management for Schools Technical Assistance Center. I work at OSHS Safe and Healthy Students on the Center for School Preparedness team and address school safety, security, and emergency management, supporting post-secondary and K-12 schools alike. The Center for School Preparedness also provides support, resources, grants, and training to support capacity building of post-secondary and K-12 educational entities. We work to build the capacity of post-secondary institutions and K-12 schools, as well as districts and state education agencies through many emergency preparedness efforts in order to build safe and healthy Schools. This webinar will supplement the emergency operations planning recommendations put forth in the Obama administration's guide for developing high-quality school emergency operations plans and the guide for developing high-quality emergency operations plans for institutions of higher education. These were developed by Ed in collaboration with the U.S. Department of Homeland Security led by Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, and the U.S. Department of Justice, led by the Federal Bureau of Investigation, or FBI, as well as the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. They represent the culmination of years of work by the federal government. This webinar is also going to supplement the Human Trafficking in American Schools report issued by Safe and Healthy Students this past I will provide information for practitioners to learn about human trafficking and the exploitation of children, the degree to which it's present in our communities, and efforts schools can take in collaboration with their community partners to protect children from trafficking and support victims of trafficking. And now I'd like to turn it over to my colleagues from the RMCA Center. Akshay? Good afternoon, and thank you, Madeline. Before we begin, I would like to go over a few housekeeping items. Our call today is set so that only our presenters can speak to the group. However, we will be taking questions. You may submit your questions at any time during the webinar using the online question and answer chat function located on the lower right-hand side of your screen. Presenters will respond to questions during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation in the order in which they are received and as time permits. Just above the Q&A chat window on your screen, you should see a file share pod that contains a downloadable PDF of today's webinar slides and supporting documents. We suggest that you download the presentation at this time so that you will be able to refer to it in the event of connectivity problems problems during the webinar. Please click on the file name and then click on the download files button to save the slides to your computer. Following our Q&A session, we invite you to log in to our community of practice in order to join a 30-minute web chat on today's topic. Information on accessing the community will be provided at the end of this presentation. Let's get started. At the RMCS Center, we are dedicated to building the capacity of state and local education agencies, schools, and IHEs in safety, security, emergency management, and preparedness in the five mission areas, prevention, mitigation, protection, response, and recovery, and developing high-quality emergency operations plans in collaboration with community partners such as law enforcement, fire personnel, emergency managers, and health and mental health practitioners. Following today's webinar and web chat, please visit our website for more information on school emergency management. I would now like to take a moment to introduce our guest presenters. We are joined today by Ms. Eve Birch and Ms. Janae Luttrell. Ms. Birch serves as the liaison for 
for domestic violence and human trafficking in the Office of Safe and Healthy Students. She is an education program specialist with primary responsibility for the School Climate Transformation Grant Initiative. Before coming to the Department of Education, Ms. Burge was the Director of Membership and Programs at the Coalition for Juvenile Justice and led the organization's Juvenile Detention Reform Initiative. She also facilitated national prevention research projects while working at the Pacific Institute for Research and Evaluation. Early in her career, Ms. Burge worked as a counselor with both court-appointed girls and incarcerated adults and volunteered with prison outreach programs. She received her degree in psychology with an emphasis on criminal justice from the University of California at Santa Cruz and is currently working toward her master's degree in communications at Johns Hopkins University. Ms. Janae Luttrell is the assistant principal at Chaparral High School. She moved to this position after serving as the region's director of guidance and wellness. She also serves as the project director for the federally funded Safe Schools Healthy Students Initiative. Janae has long been a leader in addressing social justice issues in education and has most recently focused her attention on preventing and intervening in commercial and sexual exploitation of children in San Diego County. In February 2009, Janae coordinated the first meeting of leaders in over 40 social service agencies, law enforcement agencies, the county superintendent's office, and the school board. This meeting set the stage for unprecedented cooperation in addressing the needs of children placed at high risk. The event launched the first inter Agency Information Sharing and Tracking Program, the Global Oversight Analysis Linking Systems Profile. The Goals Initiative began a new era of cooperation among school districts, law enforcement, probation, health and human services, and mental health. To this day, they all come together to share information and ideas to help the students and families of East County, San Diego. We will now review the agenda for today. This 45-minute webinar will offer practitioners the opportunity to learn how to develop high-quality EOPs that can assist in preventing, protecting students from, mitigating the effects of, responding to, and helping children recover from human trafficking-related crimes. One goal is to show district and school emergency managers how they can work together and in collaboration with their community partners such as law enforcement, mental health, child welfare, or victim service providers to address this threat. Collaboration with community partners ensures there are protective measures in place that work to help schools identify related threats and hazards, assess risk, identify vulnerabilities and assign roles, responsibilities, and responses to ensure the safety and privacy of children when responding to human trafficking related threats and hazards. Ms. Burge will begin today by providing an overview of the topic. And following that, we will hear from Ms. Luttrell. She will describe actions practitioners can take to protect children and youth at school from trafficking, as well as ways educators may support victims of tra trafficking. The presentation will conclude with an overview from Ms. Sullivan and myself on how to integrate human tra trafficking into the federally re recommended six-step planning process for developing high-quality EOPs. And then we'll begin our Q&A session followed by our web chat. At, at this time, I am pleased to turn it over to Ms. Eve Burge of the Office of Safe and Healthy Students. Eve? Thank you, Akshay. Um, I'm so happy to be here. And, and, and it's an opportune time for us to be talking about human trafficking and what it looks like in schools. 
um, as it, it's January and um, Human Trafficking Prevention Month. So um, I, I want folks on the line to know that this is happening. And um, at, at the Department of Education, I hear from school communities that, that let me know um, that you know they didn't know what to look for, but now that they know what to look for, they're seeing this. Um, and and, uh, and and want to know how they can um, and and want to know what to do. So we did just develop a guide, and we'll talk a little bit more about, about that. Um, but uh, I'm 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 very glad that uh, we got this invitation from the REMS team. So, so let's see. This is, um, this is information that, um, that President Obama provided to us. Um, in, in, this was in uh, just just last year in December, um, I'd like for folks to just take a minute to to read his proclamation. So our goal today is going to be to talk about um, the importance of addressing human trafficking in schools. This is a responsibility that we have. Um, and, and, and also to understand the current climate of trafficking, um, what it looks like. It's continually kind of changing, and Janae will be able to um, to talk about what she's seeing when she's talking to and visiting schools across the country. Okay. Um, so tra trafficking, just to provide a, a definition, it's the exploitation of a person through force, fraud, or, co or coercion and for the purpose of forced labor, commercial sex, or both. Um, it's important to understand that if someone is under 18 and convinced to perform a commercial sex act, it's a crime regardless of whether there's force, fraud, or coercion. In the past, um, victims of commercial sexual exploitation and or human trafficking have been treated as criminals. Um, you know, young prostitutes, they are victims. And federal and state law points to this. Um, they're often lured by the promise of a better life. The recruiters that we see are incredibly creative in their coercion tactics. They know how vulnerable um, their targets are, and they know their susceptibilities. So w w we'll focus today on the two types of child tra trafficking. Um, I, I just mentioned child sex trafficking, and then we'll also talk a little bit about child labor trafficking. Um, and, and understanding that, um, understanding what this looks like is um, is is important if we're going to to stop this growing 
underlying pervasiveness that, that we see in schools. Um, it's modern day slavery. It's got to go. Uh, th this just gives you some snapshots. The International Labor Organization estimated that children represent 26% or 5.5 million of the 20, well, the, all, of the almost 21 million vic victims worldwide. One out of eight runaways is likely a victim of human trafficking. Um, not all traffickers are adults, and, and that's very important. Increasingly, we're seeing students recruiting other students on school campuses. Many child victim, victims of trafficking are students. Um, school administrators and staff should be aware that cases of trafficking are being reported in communities throughout the nation, and we've found that no community, no urban, rural, suburban, no school, no socioeconomic group, no student demographic, and nobody is immune to this. Um, and, and for us, for educators, for school personnel, the reality of trafficking and the severity, um, it really can be and should be a call to action. Um, it's child abuse. And, uh, and it needs to be handled as such. So, th so this slide um, talks a little, little bit about child sex trafficking. Uh, when a person or when a child or um, somebody under 18 years of age is induced to perform a commercial sex act, um, that's child sex trafficking. Uh, proving force, fraud, or coercion against the child's pimp or, or trafficker isn't necessary for the offense to be characterized as trafficking. Um, the, the use of children in the commercial sex trade is prohibited is prohibited, as I mentioned, both under U.S. law and by statute in most countries all over the world. Um, it has devastating consequences for, for young people, including long-lasting physical and psychological trauma, diseases, um, HIV AIDS, drug addiction, unwanted pregnancies, malnutrition, social ostracism, and, um, and and even death we've seen. So each of these victims will have a different experience, um, and that makes it somewhat tricky for us to identify, but we'll talk about indicators. But their experiences often share some common threads. Um, and, and they live under the control of their trafficker, so they're subject to to continual fear, they're subject to abuse, and um, in, in many cases, denial of basic human rights. We'll also cover child labor, labor tra trafficking, pardon me, and um, so just a little bit about what labor trafficking looks like. Um, and, and children may legally engage in certain forms of work. But there are legal prohibitions and widespread condemnation against forms of slavery or slavery-like practices. Um, and yet, you know, we see that these practices continue to exist. Um, labor trafficking, it, it, it takes many forms. Uh, there could be bonded labor or debt bondage, and that would be um, like, like where a child incurs a debt that they're never able to pay off, or um, involuntary domestic servitude, where a, a young person is forced to work in somebody's home for long, long hours with no, no pay or little pay. Some indicators of, of, um, of, of forced labor 
includes situations where the child appears to be in, in the custody of a non-family member who requires the child to perform work that financially is benefiting somebody outside the child's family and doesn't offer the child the option of leaving. In the U.S., labor, labor trafficking often occurs in the context of domestic service, um, but also agricultural work, peddling, um, in the hospitality industry, like, like restaurants and hotels. Traffickers, they, they will manipulate these victims into working very long hours in, in substandard conditions for um, for little or no pay. Peddling, which I see in Washington, is, um, is, is prevalent, but it's lesser known. It's lesser known as a form of child labor. Um, and that's where you see children selling cheap goods like candy or magazines, um, sometimes going door to door or standing on the street. Um, and you know, oftentimes the weather conditions are really, really poor. They don't have access to food and water or, um, or bathroom facilities. So like victims of sex trafficking, labor trafficking victims are kept in bondage. And that's through a combination of fear, intimidation, abuse, and psychological controls. So it's important to remember that child victims of Labor trafficking also might be sexually abused or simultaneously might be victims of, of sex trafficking. Okay, so as I said at the top, schools can and need to be safe havens for students, um, especially for students whose lives are otherwise characterized by instability and by a lack of safety and security. We, or school personnel, all of you, are uniquely well positioned to identify and re report suspected abuse and connect these students to services. Um, these actions can, um, can prevent trafficking. They can save their lives. So everyone who's part of the school community, and that's all of that school resource officers, administrators, teachers, bus drivers, maintenance personnel, food service staff, um, and all of us have, have the potential to be an ad advocate for these young people. Um, but first, we need to know the indicators, we need to know the warning signs, um, and we need to know how to respond when a student appears to be a victim. And, and this, is a, a, this is the right time to say that school personnel shouldn't really address these issues alone. They're com complex, and it really ends up being a, a collaborative effort. Um, and Child Protective Services needs to be at the table. Law enforcement needs to be at the table. Social services and your community-based service providers. So at this time, um, I'm going to pass it over to Janae, and, and she can give you an idea of what this looks like in her school community and other school communities that she's visited. Thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, I am speaking to you from the front line here in San Diego and to kind of reinforce that you'll probably hear a school bell ring in a couple minutes, so I apologize in advance for our school bell. Um, but yes, the need to address human trafficking or the commercial sexual exploitation of children, in my opinion, is not only necessary for schools to accomplish our goal, but because we have caring, passionate adults who are connected to young people and sometimes can first see any change of behavior 
behaviors or any, any warning signs. And because we have established relationships with child welfare and laws in place, we must as schools respond. And if we do not respond and create safe learning environments, both physically and psychologically safe, we are going to never accomplish our goals of having students engaged in the learning process and accomplishing their academic goals and moving on to successful lives beyond. And when you speak about human trafficking in relation to schools, it's important to note that research shows that there is a strong correlation between human tra trafficking of children children and school-related problems, disabilities, disengagement, dropping out, et cetera. And having said that, that's where schools themselves can serve as huge protective factors because the healthier, there we go, I apologize, the healthier, uh, more structured, protective environment that our school environment can offer a child, the more likely it is that we are able to protect that student from being recruited in or exploited or for exploiters to feel comfortable um, on our campus or in our community. And as I speak, I just want to let you know that so much of this information we're speaking about today is relevant for the K-12 environment but also for the higher ed institutions. And so in advance, I want to let you know I may interchangeably use the term school campus or school, school site. But again, for us, it's, it's relevant at the school site level. For us, we do this work at a school district level, and in San Diego, we are are actually working region-wide and expanding out our efforts to all 42 school districts. So you may hear me use those terms interchangeably. Some of the behavioral indicators that are important for us to acknowledge um, from the front line are the attendance is usually a huge first red flag. Um, students that are or disengaging from traditional um, protective factors. They will no longer want to participate in sporting activities. Um, they, they will no longer want to be involved in some of the pro-social um, environments that school that students used to be involved with on campus, or there's some resistance to even wanting to participate. at first. Um, and as we're speaking about this, Eve did a great job of explaining that we're not, not just talking about females or males. We're talking about students of both genders, transgender. And, and when we're speaking about it, because we're school-age children, just where those children are in their maturation process, often times just puts them at risk based on their desire to connect, their desire to be highly influenced by their peers, their natural maturation of disconnecting from a home life or parental units. If those parental units are in place, the natural process, especially in middle school to high school, is to disengage and to kind of start to connect stronger with peers. However, some of the exploiters have learned this and used that age range as an opportunity to try to um, turn their motives um, in a negative way for these young, for these young victims. Um, once a student is victimized, identifying him or her can prove to be difficult. Um, on the slide, you'll see a variety of different different behavioral indicators that we've seen in Southern California, but frankly across the nation and research also supports. Um, having said that, I have worked with victims or survivors that have virtually very few behavioral indicators, at 
least on the surface. And once we started working with understanding their background, we saw that they did have some trauma or, or some other variables that were not extremely evident from just the surface on the school level. Um, so I just want to caution to not, not disregard the possibility if you see, if you're concerned about a student who may have potentially a few number of the behavioral indicators, there's also the chance that he or she may be involved. On that note, as we switch to risk factors, there are many different research risk factors that research supports that we know kind of puts a young person at risk to be more vulnerable or to be a higher target for some of the exploiters. Um, those risk factors you see above, um, we, we have isolation. Um, one of the ways that we've seen that come to play is um, it, we have evidence that some of our, our gang traffickers are, are working to identify some of these children who are more loners or maybe not have a strong social network on campus and actually target those students, invite them to social engagements outside of school, um, pretend to befriend that child, and actually have the, the goal the entire time is to slowly groom and um, shape that child into being a target or an actual victim of their exploitation. Um, and I also want to highlight, and I know that um, Eve had said this earlier, but evidence does suggest that lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender youth can be up to five times more likely than heterosexual youth to be victims. And so for us in the school environment, when we're um, working with children and providing clubs and supports in a variety of different ways, I think it's also important that we realize that we have to provide supports for all students and make sure that we provide not only culturally appropriate, but trauma-specific services and really meet the needs of all of our students. Um, some of the trafficking recruitment tactics that we've seen here as well as across the nation is, as Eve mentioned, we have seen a significant increase in older adult exploiters or traffickers, pimps if you will, who um, specifically send students into a school site to recruit other students out of that school site. And in many cases, we've seen um, the exploiters kind of use our McKinney-Vinto laws of needing to enroll in an accompanied youth immediately um, to get a student enrolled in a campus that he or she has identified as a high-target campus. They will actually intentionally enroll a student as a, a recruiter. And, and of course, by law and for good practice, we want all students to be engaged in, in school as quickly as possible. It's just another layer for us on the front line to keep in mind. Um, we've also seen that some of our, our open events in the evening, football games, basketball where there might be a natural um, connection, maybe a previous, maybe a graduate from a few years prior might naturally show up to a sporting event, but um, oftentimes they know that they'll have access to some vulnerable, unsupervised students, and they will use those opportunities um, to actually um, meet and begin grooming a student into um, trafficking. And then off campus, although we see it 
come onto campus, we, we know, know that they use Facebook, Snapchat, internet sites. We know that they are using a variety of, of different um, techniques, mainly media driven, to communicate with victims during the school day, to um, recruit them off campus. In a couple cases, we've seen um, traffickers call the students into school absent as if he or she were a parent calling their child in sick and um, a best practice we've developed is to have our attendance clerks actually, when suspicious, ask a quick clarifying um, fact piece, for instance, and what is your cell phone again, sir, or, or um, and again, what is your daughter's birth date, something that they, he or she should know quickly so we, we can verify, and we've been successful in kind of um, identifying identifying students that we need to support and um, pulling in law enforcement as necessary. And then off campus, we also know that when victims, when young people and they're lured into exploitation, that there's not only um, the immediate impact and the violence and the risk that they're involved in, but that can carry long term, which then carries back to the impact in the learning environment, even when he or she has been recovered and, and um, is back engaged in the learning environment. Um, one of the tactics that we've done here in Southern California is once we've identified a student, we also keep in mind what is in the best interest of that student. Um, so if we have a that is re-engaged in the learning environment, we look holistically about school safety and think about where is the best school placement for him or her, how do we make sure that he or she is protected from um, any backlash from peers or community, and make sure that we're putting him or her in the best learning environment. And if that means transferring him or her to another school site that can offer the same academic supports, but also maybe um, be a little bit safer for him or her. Those are some techniques that we've actually employed here. And um, best practice would be for a school site, a school district, a region to come together with their partners, as, as you heard from Eve, doing this work alone as a school is virtually impossible because it doesn't, it's not about the schools, the work and the impact of the human trafficking comes off campus, onto campus, and then back off campus. It's essential that we have our partners such as child welfare, law enforcement, probation, our service workers, um, our victim services, everyone who touches the lives of young people in a community should be working collaboratively to develop a protocol that makes sense and will work for their community. So for our protocol, one of the things that we've developed is once we've trained all of our school personnel and we do that annually, we um, make it clear that if they have a suspected activity around exploitation or recruitment, we pull in our school resource officers and our administrative team. We first support the um, potential victim or victims, and we make sure that we are addressing any potential larger campus impacts, um, and, and our law have all been trained, and we work on this as a team. If we suspect we have a victim, we also have the responsibility of communicating that with a parent or guardian and making any appropriate 
referrals as well as reports to child welfare, et cetera. And then if we confirm that we have a victim of human trafficking, we go through many of those same steps, but we're also thinking about the recovery process for him or her and how to meet his or her psychological needs while we're keeping them safe on campus. I'm now going to move into the second portion of our agenda, speaking about the landscape of the K-12 human trafficking threats and trends. Although, again, as I mentioned earlier, this is not solely about the K-12 environment. Many of the recruitment tactics, the um, targeting of vulnerable um, young people can also be transferred to the higher education environments. For us, we're seeing that our community colleges are um, also a high recruitment area. Um, our English language learner classes at the higher ed institutions are becoming um, targeted areas of our traffickers and the reason why we're able to stay abreast of this so as quickly as we are is because we have an ongoing collaboration with all of our partners, which does speak to the information sharing and collaboration. It is essential. Um, what we see on a campus makes sense to us on a campus, but it can be extremely relevant and provide a wealth of information to our partners. For us, when we started this work in 2009, we didn't understand some of the dynamics that were happening on a campus. Um, for instance, we might dismiss a fight between two female students as a traditional fight between two female students, which unfortunately we've seen through the history of school. Um, what, we're, we, what we came to understand is oftentimes that can be speaking to enforcement, that can be, tempt, um, I'm sorry, um, connected to a pimp or exploiter and um, can often be times connected to a element that's going to be happening off campus. So for us, one of the things we've developed is a standard communication with our law enforcement that we actually have on campus to let them know of tensions that we're working with that they may not be involved with, with but are relevant to other activities. So for us, we keep that communication flowing both ways. Um, we also do annual trainings, and it's best practice to provide those trainings to all school personnel with more in-depth training for um, your administrative team, your nursing personnel, personnel, your campus supervision, um, any, anybody that is going to, or your school psychologist, anybody that's going to be working with kids in a way that they might have a broader ability to see a change of their behavior, but also see how that's connected to other elements on campus, um, and the risk factors are important as well as language, the, um, the latest and greatest, um, if you will. So in the short time that we've been addressing this, we've seen an extreme change in some of the terminology, the ways in which the children are being exploited. Um, they're being exploited much more Via, for us, we're seeing Snapchat be used in a way that we didn't see a year or two years ago. And so as we're learning this, and we're sharing it. And 
and as soon as we share it, we're learning something else and we continue to, to get that information out. Unfortunately, our exploiters and our traffickers are highly organized and the way in which they communicate is very well developed and we also have to, to be as developed and organized. And on having said that, this is not a school-only responsibility. Schools are a huge, huge portion of our community, and they are significantly important in addressing this. But we are only a portion of the community, and bringing all of our partners, stakeholders, parents, community groups together, and having an ongoing cross-system communication is important, and also having a shared responsibility and addressing it is key. Some of the human trafficking threats and trends that we've seen across the nation, as I worked with Eve in the Department of Education and putting together this guide, we um, had the chance to work with the nation across the nation as well into some communities in Canada. And what we found is, unfortunately, whether you're on the East Coast or West Coast, traffickers are, are again, highly organized. They're targeting young people. They're tar targeting young people in part because of what we explained earlier with their maturation. They have learned where some of our most vulnerable children and attend school where some of our most vulnerable children live in a community. Um, if they're in a foster home, they've learned where many of those foster homes are located. And um, they use that knowledge for their financial gain and the um, pain of our children. So activities and tactics change quickly. and. They um, are communicating as rapidly um, as we are, and I say that to say it's also important when we're working with young people on a campus to, to know that intelligence and information goes both ways. So we work really hard to make sure that exploiters understand that we um, are, are temp-free zones. This, this is a learning environment, and our children are going to be safe. And we also know that um, exploiters not only are planting students in schools, but they also are have eyes on campus. So there was a situation in Northern California where a young person was working with their um, administrative team to communicate about their exploitation and a student um, who was not necessarily a recruiter or a trafficker went back and recruited it, recruited that information to her pimp, and there was some backlash for her. So we, work, you have, we have to be mindful of how to protect our students in every way. Um, we also know that there's all different forms of trafficking and all different levels, and unfortunately, I've seen um, students who are slowly groomed and, and um, move into this in, in a very, very methodical manner from the trafficker, trafficker's end. And unfortunately, we've seen students who um, had minimal background or history and get recruited in immediately and, and almost almost immediately disappear or become a runaway or missing person. And again, that kind of speaks to the last bullet where they're no longer attending school. They're um, completely disengaged. And, and if they attend, it's very, very limited. Um, having said that, I think that's why the work of the Department of Education and the um, work of the REMS group to put this webinar together is so important because 
because those of us on the front line in the schools have a unique lens and understanding about young people and their behaviors. And it is often those of us in schools who can see a change in the behavior. Social networks are extremely important. Um, young people might have minimal risk factors, but we've seen, uh, I've seen firsthand a young person who might be new to the campus and, and might have minimal risk factors maybe from out of state. And um, if a social network that's connected to exploitation off campus gets, if he or she enters that friendship group, that student's extremely at risk of being recruited. And that's where we as schools have to balance how to keep our campus safe, how to keep all students engaged, and how to provide a, an environment where everyone can learn equally. I'm now passing off my portion to Madeline. All is good, and thank you so much, Janae. Um, so now we're going to move on to uh, uh, another section, another part of the presentation, and we'll discuss with you how you can integrate this really critical topic of tra trafficking into the six-step planning process. And, um, for developing school emergency operations plans. So, um, for in emergency management, in school, school emergency management, um, our foundation is found in in, um, in the PPD, the National Preparedness Directive. So, um, this. This represents the nation's approach to preparedness, and it's a key component of planning and acting to support the whole school community from a wide variety of threats and hazards, including trafficking. So this approach aims to align all planning efforts from the building and district levels to the state and federal levels. And when we talk about the Preparedness Directive, um, and when we talk about preparedness, we speak of it in five mission areas, prevention, mitigation, protection, response, and recovery. These together work to build preparedness. And so, um, so all, all the things in a school, that a school does, a district does, all in prevention, in essence, builds preparedness. And everything they do in protection, and again, it builds preparedness. And so through the emergency management planning process, it offers a wonderful opportunity for districts and schools to tie together so many of those important initiatives that don't necessarily um, seem like like school emergency management at first. Instead, they go to promoting and developing and nurturing that safe and healthy teaching and learning environment. And it works to avert, avoid, deter, stop um, bad things from happening to the entire school community. Whoops. So, um, we're going to talk a little bit briefly about those five preparedness missions. And uh, um, so when we talk about prevention in this um, setting, it means the capabilities necessary to avoid, deter, or stop an imminent crime, threatened, or actual mass casualty incident. So again, and this includes trafficking and the commercial sexual exploitation of children and youth. For example, districts and schools can take steps to raise awareness among staff. The 
school community, including in the whole school community, including students and parents and guardians and all of their community partners. So it's, as Janae was explaining and describing, it's important that everyone is aware and everyone um, is keyed in to those current and ever-changing activities. And as Eve stated, it's important to collaborate and not have schools working on this alone. So protection um, means the capability to secure schools against acts of violence and man-made or natural disasters. Schools can take steps to protect their school community from this crime and others, um, including efforts to recruit more victims from the school community. Mitigation means the, the capabilities necessary to eliminate or reduce the loss of life, injury, and property damage by lessening the impact of an event um, or an emergency. By collaborating with community partners, schools can take lots of actions to strengthen supports for students who are at risk of trafficking, involved in trafficking, and even the survivors of trafficking. So for example, schools can provide those students with a safe way to disclose information. They can work to equip staff with positive means for reporting. And critical to mitigation is districts and schools working with these students as victims as opposed to criminals. So response is the, um, it means the capability is necessary to stabilize an emergency once it's already happened or is certain to happen in an unpreventable way. So for trafficking, this can mean learning the signs and knowing how and when to reach out to community partners as well as working to raise the awareness of the school community and, and teaching them steps that they can take if themselves or someone they know are being victimized or they're concerned that it might be happening. Part of this response, which is important may include the prevention of additional threats to a victim and even the school that is caring um, for that, that victim. Recovery means the capabilities necessary to assist schools affected by an event or an emergency in restoring the learning environment. So here is where um, schools can work with their community partners to ensure that the victims have access to the necessary support and are able to work through the recovery process and lessening that trauma and strengthening their coping skills so that the children and youth may positively pursue educational opportunities. Again, so in in when we do school emergency management, we work hard to look at all threats and all hazards, and, and find common functions we can do to, to prevent and protect and mitigate and respond and recover from um, um, incidents. And so we, we use the paradigm of before, during, and after. So we look at these threats and we look at the school community and we try to think of what we can do before and what we can do during and what we can do after to support the whole school community. So before, generally it's the majority of this prevention and mitigation and protective activities that generally happen before an incident. But it's important that these three missions do have ongoing activities that can occur throughout an incident. So as we were talking earlier, once a, a child has, has been identified as a victim of um, trafficking, we still need to continue 
to prevent further injury and to help them um, with coping skills to prevent further isolation. So uh, um, during is generally those response activities that happen when an incident is identified. However, effective response is, is most influenced by having all of this work done in advance. So, for example, if someone has a safe outlet for disclosing and everyone knows that procedure for reporting in advance, it's more likely that it will take place. And it's more likely that it will take place and be effective if this has been worked out on how to receive those notifications. So although during refers to those efforts or courses of action that take place during an event, the majority of the work that's done is done in advance. After recovery activities, these begin. These can begin as soon as an incident occurs. So the similar response, the majority of those recovery efforts are strongest or most effective when they're available in advance and can be applied immediately and scaled up, whether it's to support you know one individual or the entire school community, depending upon the trauma or the incident. So when we speak about preparedness, we're talking about activities in all five of these missions and thinking about them as before, during, and after. So engaging in any one of these initiatives, we are building preparedness. Okay. So when we, when we do school emergency management, um, with our community partners, so with, with law enforcement and fire officials and, um, and, and welfare agencies and such, we use a six-step process. And uh, um, we often use this process repeatedly so as to build and strengthen um, effective plans. Okay, so step one of the planning process is form a collaborative team and create a common framework. So the close collaboration between schools and community partners is critical. Not only does it ensure coordination of efforts and the integration of EOPs, it makes available to educators all the necessary data, skills, and resources that they need to protect the school community. So um, another thing is, if you so when we form this collaborative team, um, in general, it is going to include the community partners of law enforcement, fire officials, and such. When we talk about tra trafficking, and we want to support the school community from trafficking threats and hazards, it's many of these same community partners. So when we're at the table discussing a number of threats and hazards, they're there, and it's another reason to include this critical topic in our work with emergency management and the six-step planning process. So as even Janae mentioned, there's lots of folks within the school and the district that should be included should be trained and taught um, how to protect the school community. So from administrators and educators to school resource officers and school psychologists. And as Janae mentioned, we do, do want to include the McKinney-Vento um, per personnel or the education of homeless children and youth coordinators. They have a lot to offer in terms of support and a lot to gain in terms of supporting those children. Um, just as much as it's 
imperative that, that law enforcement address this issue in the community. It's imperative that schools and law enforcement work together to address this. It's not just a school issue, and it's not just a community issue. So, um, part of the, the communication, part, part of the collaboration through, throughout this planning process includes working with them, uh, with anyone who has a role and responsibility in school safety, security, and emergency management, and the particular hazards and threats that faces the school community. So, as we we learned from Eve and Janae this is an issue that every school district faces. And then something to think about, although they're not likely to be a primary member of a district or school's planning team, they are likely to have resources. So it's recommended that you reach out to your state education agency for additional support. So, and then um, in step one, we talk about forming a collaborative team and then forming a common structure. And one way to think of this common structure is to, um, to exchange information. And when someone's saying risk factors, everyone knows what it means. So you come up with a common set of terminology. And, and um, you also talk about programs and places where there's commonalities there. So for example, it's um, common that schools use PBIS, and it's also common that police use the community-oriented policing services. Both of these are data collection that work to inform um, next steps and interventions and support, and they could be used in conjunction. So those are important things to talk about in step one with your partners. So in step two, we talk about um, districts and schools working to identify all the threats and hazards they face. And then they're going to work to assess their risk and identify any vulnerabilities as it relates to those threats and hazards, and from there work to prioritize. So trafficking is a possible threat for schools nationwide from recruitment to victimization and, and to supporting victims. Cases of human trafficking have been reported in all 50 states, Washington, D.C., and the U.S. territories. So the children that are at risk are not, not just the high school students. As Janae and Eve were telling us, the, the studies demonstrate that tra traffickers have been preying on victims as young as 12 years old. And they've been reported targeting their minor victims through, as Janae was describing, all of the social media, including telephone, chat lines, clubs on the street, at the malls, and so on and so on. So, um, <clears throat> so the, each planning team should recognize this as a hazardous threat and then assess the risk posed by the threats and hazards, and then they're going to look at their school's population and any vulnerabilities when it comes to the recruitment of children into trafficking and the act of trafficking children. And we heard a lot from Janae about the risk factors and, and some of the, um, the behavioral indicators. So this information should weave together. So, um, as Eve described with the human trafficking in America's schools, there's a protocol in there. This can be used to help further assess the school district and the school and the degree to which this is prevalent or there might be um, which the indicators are prevalent. This also could be addressed with many of the um, culture and climate assessments that are often used by districts and schools. And then it can also be addressed with some of the site 
assessments that are commonly done by you know, school emergency managers with their law enforcement partners and fire officials. So putting all of this together is going to help inform and prioritize the hazards and threats. And it's also going to help inform next steps when the planning team is going to work together to create strategies to prevent or mitigate recruitment of children and the, um, of trafficking and the act of trafficking children. So using this protocol and using the six steps together, districts and schools can get a better idea of the degree to which is present and they can address it and protect the students. So at this point, I'm going to pass it over to my colleague Akshay to talk about the next three steps. Thank you, Madeline. So in steps three and four, uh, the planning team will develop goals and objectives to address human trafficking as identified in step two. And then we'll develop courses of action for accomplishing each of the objectives. Goals, objectives, and courses of action should address threats and hazards before, during, and after a human trafficking incident occurs. As the planning teams develop courses of action for threats and hazards, they should also consider the federal, state, and local regulations or mandates that often apply to specific hazards. It is likely that there will be common action steps to address human trafficking that will fall into functional categories that overlap with a variety of other threats and hazards. However, it may be necessary for your school to create a human trafficking threat and hazard-specific annex. Functional annexes focus on the critical operational functions and the courses of action developed to carry them out, while threat and hazard-specific annexes describe the courses of action unique to particular threats and hazards. And more information on functional and threat and hazard-specific annexes is available on the REMS TA Center website. After determining the goals, objectives, and courses of action related to human trafficking, the planning team moves into step five, plan preparation, review, and approval. While the content of the plan to address human trafficking was developed in steps three and four, in step five, the content is written out and then reviewed. The recommended criteria for a well-designed plan include Addressing how the annex connects to state, county, and municipal plans, identifying a chain of command, including contact information for key staff, and clearly identifying roles and responsibilities. This will help in reinforce everyone's roles and responsibilities and work to formalize as many informal initiatives. In step six, the planning team is asked, tasked with implementing and maintaining the plan, including how to address human trafficking. Step six involves training stakeholders on the plan and their responsibilities. This includes raising awareness of trafficking, educating school personnel, families, guardians, and students on how to recognize signs of human trafficking, how to re report to of human trafficking, how to support victims of trafficking, and educating. Conducting after-action reviews of both drills and actual human trafficking emergencies, this is where we work together to glean lessons learned and look for possible signs that may have been missed or ways to improve the reporting mechanism, reviewing, revising, and maintaining the plan, and finally exercising the plan. Identifying lessons learned closes the loop in the planning process. Lessons learned add to the information collected in step two, understand the situation, so that the planning process starts again.
Everyone involved in the plan needs to know their roles and responsibilities before, during, and after an emergency. Key training components include the following. Hold a meeting. At least annually hold a meeting to educate all parties on the plan. These meetings should include school leadership, key stakeholders, including staff, students, families, and guardians, community partners, first responders, emergency managers, and public and mental health officials, additional stakeholders, such as local business officials, relevant district, local, regional, and or state agencies, other organizations who may use the school building, and also having experts speak on the subject and raise awareness to the issue and the district's efforts to deal with it. Distribute materials. Give appropriate and relevant literature describing the plan, policies, and procedures, and the key threats and hazards it addresses. It may also be helpful to provide all parties with quick reference guides that remind them of key courses of action. Post key information, such as reporting hotlines and awareness materials for students. Visit key locations. Show appropriate a description of the plan and mechanisms for reporting possible cases of trafficking. For example, if a particular location or meeting spot is believed to be used for recruitment, visit and work with management. Teach roles and responsibilities. Staff will be assigned specific roles in the plan and positions supporting the ICS that will require special skills such as first aid, threat assessment, and provision of personal assistance services for English language learners, students with disabilities, and others with access and functional needs. Also, substitute teachers must be trained on the plan and their roles in the plan. Finally, bringing community partners, such as law enforcement, fire officials, EMS, emergency managers, and public and mental health officials into the school to talk about the plan